dear friends of Brown China Summit, we hope that you and your family are all doing well during this extremely challenging time. While we did have to move Brown China Summit 2020 online, we still firmly believe that the time for dialogue is now, that dialogue is as important as ever. And I just thought I would introduce myself real quick and also introduce Michael. My name is Ben Lipson. I'm a current Brown undergraduate studying political science and East Asian studies. And I will be co-moderating today with Michael Chen, a current Brown undergrad concentrating in international relations and economics. Today, on behalf of Brown China Summit, we are incredibly humbled to engage in dialogue with our three renowned panelists, each of whom brings a wealth of experience and expertise to the table. Um, so first, I'll introduce Dr. Overholt. Uh, Dr. Overholt is currently a senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School and author of nine books, including The Rise of China and China's Crisis of Success. He's been involved with China in different walks of life. He spent 16 years doing research at think tanks, 21 years running investment bank research teams, and 12 years at Harvard. He's been a consultant on strategic planning and foreign affairs to many corporations, banks, and governmental departments, as well as a political advisor to several of Asia's and Africa's major political figures at turning points in their history. During, from 2013 to 15, he also served as senior fellow and then president of the Fung Global Institute in Hong Kong. While Dr. Overholt was an undergrad at Harvard in 1967 to 68, he actually organized the then Harvard China Conference, a predecessor to conferences like Brown China Summit today. Um, Dr. Sui Sheng Zhao is professor and executive director of the Center for China-US Cooperation at the Corbell School of International Studies at University of Denver. He's founder and editor of the Journal of Contemporary China, a member of the Board of Governors of the US Committee of the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific, a member of the National Committee on US-China Relations, a research associate at the Fairbanks Center for East Asian Research at Harvard, and an honorary Jianjin professor at Beijing University, Renmin University, and Fudan University. Dr. Zhao has also previously taught at Washington College, Colby College, and the Graduate School of International Relations and Pacific Studies at University of California, San Diego. He's the author and editor of 10 books and numerous articles. And finally, Ambassador Richard Boucher is a senior US diplomat turned current Brown University professor. Over a 32 year career, he achieved the highest rank in the US Foreign Service as a career ambassador. His career began in China at the start of economic reform. In his later career, he became the longest serving spokesman in the history of the State Department, serving six secretaries of state. He then served as Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asia. Boucher also served as US Ambassador to Cyprus, Consul General in Hong Kong during the handover, and led US efforts for Asia Pacific economic cooperation as US senior official for APEC. After retiring from the State Department, Ambassador Boucher served four years as Deputy Secretary General of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the international organization of 35 countries working together to coordinate economic policy. He now teaches diplomacy and foreign policy to Brown University students as a senior fellow at the Watson Institute for International Public Affairs. As you all can probably tell, our three experts all bring a wealth of experience and expertise, and we're really excited to be able to speak with them today. To start, as the original goal of our politics panel was to kind of demystify domestic Chinese politics, we figured that it would be smart to ask you all if there was some sort of insight that you could share about Chinese politics, economy, and society within the context of modern Chinese bureaucracy, within the context of modern Chinese society. So we can start, um, if you would like, with Dr. Overholt. Well, first of all, congratulations on organizing the conference. And it's, it's uh, such a pleasure to be here with the other panelists. I knew Richard Boucher when he was the Consul General in Hong Kong. And I've been an admirer ever since. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's uh, useful to start at just our, our basic conception of how Chinese politics works. If you uh, listen to our media, uh, Xi Jinping is the omnipotent uh, uh, dictator for life. Uh, impression is that he can pretty much uh, do whatever he wants. Uh, he's described as China's Putin. And I think a, a lot of that is uh, uh, just terribly wrong. 
Um, he's certainly extremely powerful. He's got all the three major titles in, in the Chinese polity, and he, he's got a list of other titles that are uh, running small leading groups on all sorts of things that, that uh, it takes more than a page to list. Uh, he, he's eliminated all of his uh, potential adversaries. Uh, he's in the Constitution. He's gotten rid of Chinese term limits for himself. Uh, it's pretty impressive. At the same time, much of the Chinese elite uh, believes that he's taking the country backwards rather than forwards. Uh, if you talk to scholars, journalists, uh, basically the, the, the whole high, highly educated elite, uh, you've got this kind of hapless feeling that things aren't quite going in the direct the things are going somewhat the opposite direction of what they expected. Uh, you've got a lot of it, resistance within the bureaucracy, uh, uh, the party, the government, the military. In fact, the, the, uh, the concern about being held responsible for Xi's policies is, is so great that uh, a lot of people try to resign, and, and there's a there's a slogan: "I promote you because I hate you." Uh, in the sense that you, you give somebody responsibility for implementing key policies, uh, that uh, the the consequences for them will ultimately be bad. And and finally, uh, well. Americans and Westerners in general see all these titles and the repression as a signs of strength. That's not how the Chinese people see it. It's very hard to find, they see it as, as uh, resulting from fear and insecurity. And uh, it's very hard to find a middle class or upper middle class family that isn't trying to get its kids and its money out of China. How about this image of uh, Xi as the Putin of China? Uh, I'd say it's exactly the opposite of truth. Xi Jinping is an executive hired to do a job and accountable to the Communist Party of China. Putin's party on the other hand, is simply there to aggrandize more money and power for Putin. The comparison is entirely in China's favor, but it, it uh, puts uh, Xi Jinping's role in an entirely different light once you realize that. Now, what's the job that Xi has been given to do? The, the primary job is to reform the economy and move it forward. Uh, and there, he basically has not been doing the job he was hired to do. Uh, I talk about market allocation of resources, uh, but there's $1.7 trillion worth of subsidies going to the, the state enterprises. Um, there's talk about marketizing the role of the state enterprises, but uh, they're given a they're being grouped into national champions and given an exemption from things like the, the competition law. Uh, the business community, especially the private business community, is extraordinarily unhappy. Uh, the private sector has been financially squeezed. Uh, private sector investment growth has gone from over 18% a year to under 6% a year. 
as uh, government pressures to, re to reduce uh, debt have increased, the uh, party secretaries have put, demanded more and more, from, particularly from private businesses, uh, in contributions. So, so we, we, the, this leaves Xi Jinping in a, a position that's remarkably uh, similar in its broad structure to President Trump's situation. You have an elite that's unhappy, but doesn't know what to do. And you have a mass base that uh, loves his nationalism and strongly supports his role. Uh, President Xi's mass base is proportionally much broader than, than President Trump. So that leaves him in a strong position to, to continue in power. But I think, I think he's headed into a, a period of, of, of real difficulty. Thank you very much, Dr. Overholt. Uh, we would like to then give the floor to Dr. Zhao. Uh, okay, thank you. And uh, in fact, my daughter graduated from uh, Brown. I uh, was in Brown uh, many times uh, in the old good days. I uh, have not been back to Brown for quite a while. I was looking forward to going back. <laughs> but uh, we have to talk online, but I'm so happy that you can do it online for this uh, very important summit. And the subject I'm going to discuss is about uh, uh, what the kind of internal dynamics China has uh, uh, come to uh, in terms of uh, uh, facing uh, a lot of challenges uh, internally and uh, externally. Uh, in fact, the one very important phenomenon I have uh, observed in the last several years uh, has been a polarization of the Chinese people's, uh, especially intellectuals' uh, views about where China has gone uh, uh, and where China will go from here. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, if you look at uh, China's uh, social media, uh, especially I'm on some of those kind of uh, WeChat uh, 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 talking groups, people were fighting against each other. Uh, so, um, I mean, um, uh, having it, which I have not seen for quite a while. I thought people talk different views uh, toward each other, have different uh, uh, positions about uh, whatever issues uh, uh, on China internally and externally. But now, very often you can see they cannot tolerate each other. Very often in those kind of uh, WeChat groups, people simply just uh, black someone because you cannot go along with their views. It's, uh, for example, in the last several weeks, we saw Fang Fang uh, uh, that the Wuhan uh, writer's uh, uh, diary uh, has become so, so controversial. And a lot of people in China has been very angry at her and uh, not people supporting her uh, because of the different views, uh, husband, wives, and uh, brothers, sisters, uh, and the classmates just uh, cannot uh, stay uh, in the same uh, group. So why we have come to this uh, type of situation? I think there is a huge change in the landscape of uh, uh, political uh, environment in China in not several years, uh, uh, especially since President Xi Jinping uh, came to office. Uh, uh, we have seen a very huge ideological campaign start uh, every, uh, same day, same year as a President Xi Jinping came to office. I wrote an article uh, a few years ago in Asian Survey talking about uh, uh, something like launching a ideology campaign trying to uh, redefine the regime uh, uh, legitimacy, uh, which I identified uh, three uh, uh, um, uh, isms, uh, three uh, uh, trends of uh, ideas uh, Xi Jinping has uh, tried to use. Uh, uh, one is the uh, uh, traditional communist ideology of socialism with Chinese characteristics, as he, he said, uh, 
because of old comedy theology during the reform years uh, declined, the demise, the, there was uh, kind of people lost uh, those kind of faith uh, in the Communist Party and also the direction of the, the country could not suffer. Uh, I mean, could not endure all those problems in China. So he wants to unify um, people's thinking on these issues uh, by restoring those uh, uh, communist or socialist ideology, giving people a future. Uh, especially on that subject, he tried to uh, somehow uh, reintroduce the most ideas of egalitarianism because of the poverty issue, all those problems were seen as uh, causes of China's problems. So he tried to launch those kind of anti-poverty campaign in that uh, side. The second uh, theme I can see is the nationalism. Uh, uh, although before him, there was, uh, I mean, since Tiananmen Square, in fact, uh, and there was a re-emergence of uh, nationalism. There was a campaign to promote uh, nationalism by uh, uh, Jiang Zemin and also Hu Jintao. Uh, but Xi Jinping's uh, promotion of nationalism has gone to a totally new uh, level. Uh, I, I wrote some articles in the past uh, to study Chinese nationalism in the old days, uh, uh, Hu Jintao and uh, Jiang Zemin days, uh, nationalism mostly were in three uh, themes. Uh, one was uh, uh, history, try to rewrite histories uh, uh, of uh, China, uh, uh, humiliation, all those things, uh, try to remind people uh, uh, we have to be strong. Second was uh, uh, the Communist Party struggle to help China to stand up, to uh, be independent. The third was national unity. Now Xi Jinping has gone far beyond uh, that. Uh, one is he has been so confident in China's new accomplishment, accomplishments after he was uh, 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 installed uh, in office. Uh, and China has somehow in their mind overtook the United States and some other countries to become the most powerful nation admired, uh, recognized uh, by everyone else, and uh, the national uh, pride by the Chinese people should uh, come to the level to support uh, his leadership, even he tried to uh, concentrate power in his own hand. Uh, second, I think here is uh, he has emphasized uh, 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 anti-Western uh, uh, theme, which was not that strong during the old days. Uh, nationalism. It's a, uh, he talked, emphasized the we should have a struggle to have a kind of a uh, a struggle threat and against any uh, uh, those values, those ideas uh, which uh, they don't think uh, good uh, for China. And also in fact they are not thinking not only not good for China but they are anti-China. Those are from the anti-China forces. So China has to struggle against those uh, uh, Western values. A uh, 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 third here, I think, is uh, uh, to be more confident in the Chinese system. Uh, Chinese uh, path, he talked about three competencies uh, in the Chinese path, Chinese the communist theory and, the, and Chinese system. Then he put Chinese culture, the four competencies, uh, uh, which somehow in China, but never uh, come to the level he has uh, emphasized this kind of uh, 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 confidence in the current Communist Party's uh, leadership. In fact, uh, in that uh, direction, the China model, so-called the China model, uh, China model debate uh, has come also to the new level along with this so-called uh, 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 confidence, the China uh, 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 systems. Uh, uh, for during uh, Jiang Zemin and the uh, Hu Jintao years, there were uh, a lot of talks <coughs> about China model, China past, by the Hu Jintao and uh, uh, Jiang Zemin, especially uh, Hu Jintao years to start. Hu Jintao was hesitant to endorse, officially endorse the China model because uh, it, not only because it was controversial, but also because uh, they were afraid that will cause some kind of confrontations with uh, Western countries and also cause the kind of uh, concern among some of China's neighbors, uh, development countries about China threat. Now, I don't think Xi Jinping cares about this at all. He just promoted the Chinese authoritarian type of, uh, they call 举国体制, 
uh, because how we can get to today's accomplishments because we have this uh, China uh, uh, unique uh, political system and uh, the uh, all uh, out uh, party and the government control has uh, helped China to come to the current level of development. In fact, in fact, the uh, last, last month is a, ha, ha, that has come to a really high level because uh, uh, the, the, the panda, pandemic, uh, China's, uh, they, they even talk about uh, uh, the Western countries now, they have to talk to it to copy China's uh, way of controlling this pandemic because China's a national mobilization, because uh, China used all the technology to, uh, uh, to do surveillance against the, everyone and the China's kind of local level, local police, community police, this hierarchical level of control, the uh, centralization of the authority helped China. So why the United States, why the Western countries are not successful because the democracies not work. So this type of um, China model, the confidence uh, to promote nationalism has not been seen for um, in, in the past. Of course, here uh, is United. Another uh, subject is, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Overhaut mentioned uh, that kind of uh, state centric economic development uh, uh, model, what I call the state uh, capitalism uh, model. And uh, they use a state uh, power to compete with other countries. With the US co companies uh, had not a problem with that. Trump, although I don't agree with Trump on many issues, here uh, the state capitalism way. And uh, to uh, enhance uh, uh, the uh, the technology sector and uh, everything, uh, Chinese government wants to uh, uh, promote uh, has been successful in their mind. So the second, the nationalism um, uh, uh, promotion has been also very important change uh, during the last several ye years. Third, I think is what I call Leninism or uh, our Leninist. Uh, 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 Chinese uh, style Leninist uh, 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 ideology, which is basically to centralize the power in the political arena and uh, try to discipline uh, the party and the cadres. And that's also related to what I mentioned at the very early uh, beginning that uh, try to centralize, to, to unify people's thinking and the people's uh, behavior, especially those uh, cadres. Behavior. So all these changes have created a total different political environment in China, and caused so many controversials uh, among uh, Chinese people, especially among Chinese elites. So that's why we saw what I mentioned that kind of polarization uh, of uh, ideas in China uh, among Chinese intellectuals about where China has gone, where China should go from here. Uh, also on the range of issues, almost at, uh, every issue we're talking about people have different opinions. But overall, a tendency direction now I see in China is that hardliners, nationalistic, and Leninist, even the new communist ideas are winning, prevailing in this at this time, which I see, see I don't know is how dangerous it is. I would tend to say it's very dangerous, but uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, a lot of people in China, I talk to them, they all are very, um, kind of uh, not concerned. They, they have ideas, dysfunctional democracies in the US, in the Western countries. A lot of problems in the West also give them a lot of munitions to be confident. So there is a kind of people even see this uh, uh, pandemic, to how to handle this pandemic as a competition between two political systems, authoritarianism or democratic uh, systems. And uh, a lot of people in China now uh, argue that uh, authoritarianism is more effective in dealing with this kind of a uh, crisis, which I have to wait and see. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Zhao. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Uh, before we, uh, we already have kind of like give me some questions, but before then we would like to give the floor to uh, Ambassador Boucher. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here with you. And I just wish we could all be there in person and have a, an even better time talking to each other and to the, to the audience out there. Um, I, uh, I have enormous respect for Dr. Zhao and Dr. Overholt, and it won't surprise you to find out that I agree with everything they say. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna come at it from a slightly different point of view. 
Um, I think the, the first thing I always think about with China is that uh, the way China appears domestically and foreign is all based on sort of the, the imperatives of de domestic policy. And the only real responsibility of any Chinese leader is to maintain the power of the Chinese Communist Party to rule China. And in order to achieve that, they basically try to do three things. One is to maintain control. And we saw at Tiananmen that when everything else is going on, the control matters more than anything else. The second is to maintain growth. You know, they used to say, Baba, that you had to grow at 8% in order to keep people employed. Um, maybe it's not quite 8% anymore, but uh, the need to maintain economic growth and increase prosperity to keep people happy uh, is essential to maintaining um, the control and the, and the uh, paramounts of the Chinese Communist Party. The deal is uh, you let us rule and we'll give you prosperity. And that's worked so far in China. And, but if prosperity falters, the rule of the Communist Party is in jeopardy. Uh, and the third thing they have to do is to maintain and increase China's status in the world. Remember when, uh, when she came to uh, California at Sunnylands to see Obama, they came out with this idea of a new model of great power relationships. And uh, Obama's response was kind of, uh, well, uh, okay, I guess so. And nobody quite knew what it meant and it never, nobody ever figured out what it meant. But obviously, I mean, not obviously, but I think what underlaid, uh, what was underlying this was the idea that somehow the US and China were to be seen on an equal plane. And that, we're not there yet, but that's what she, she aspires to. So between control, growth, and status, you know, that's what he's got to do. Now, if you translate that into what Xi Jinping's been doing, um, as uh, Dr. Oberholt said, he's been taking China backwards and taking China back to the days of his father in the 60s and the 50s, uh, where control is the big thing that matters. And so it's state enterprises, party leadership, party control, the party in social uh, circumstances, the party in private enterprises. Uh, and so his emphasis on party uh, uh, dominance and party control has meant that all the protestations, you know, there's all these things that they talk about, market discipline, better use of markets, more money to consumers, um, et cetera. There was just an editorial in the People's Daily, I think on Monday, talking about getting money into the hands of uh, ordinary people so they could spend it for economic resurgence. Well, they don't have the mechanisms to do that. They don't have the mechanisms to lend to private enterprises because their stimulus is being applied through state banks. And so, what you see happening now is Xi Jinping over the last seven years putting so much emphasis on big companies and state-owned enterprises and the state sector and the party that it leaves him with a lot of difficulties in trying to do the economic recovery that has to come. And so I think as we go forward, you know, the, the traditional routes to stimulus in China, the building more infrastructure uh, putting more money in the state corporations uh, and, um, you know, trying to get money out there on the streets to the masses, to be ordinary people to spend, uh, they're not there. The routes to stimulus are just not there anymore because of she's emphasis on the party and the big corporations. So I think they're going to have problems on all three fronts. They're going to have problems on control where you can't control the disease and it may keep coming back again problems on the economy because stimulus is going to be like pushing on a wet noodle uh, and parties with China's status in the world in terms of, uh, you know, for the moment, China's seen as having beaten the virus, but there are also suspicions about Chinese, about the origin of the virus in China. And I think a lot of places like Belt and Road countries are not going to want so many Chinese workers showing up. So I think they're going to have problems on all three fronts. And that means that the, the solid position of the Chinese Communist Party is, is uh, not where it should be. And that's going to lead to more uh, concerns and complaints about um, Xi Jinping's rule. Thank you so much, Ambassador Boucher. Um, one of the first questions I think that a lot of our audience might be thinking about is 
the a comparison between how China has been reacting to COVID-19 uh, to how it was back during SARS. So, uh, and this can be addressed by any of you. Uh, how has China's reaction to, uh, how was China's reaction to SARS? And uh, uh, how does it compare to COVID-19? And what has China done differently and why? It's a hard question. I mean, I, I, I think if I remember correctly in SARS, the first thing they did was fire the health minister. Um, and I, I don't see that they've tried to hold anybody responsible for COVID-19 at this point, um, which means the responsibility rests with the central leadership for what happens or doesn't happen. For the moment, they're looking good because they've been able to stomp it out. Um, the question going forward is, do they have a second phase? You know, do they have a, a rebound of the, of the virus? Do they have a third phase? Uh, but more important than that, how successful are they going to be getting economy back on track? So I think this is so much more extensive, so much deeper. It affects the lives of ordinary citizens so much more than SARS. Uh, this is a bigger test. I think in the initial stage, there were a lot of similarities because they both started with cover-ups and uh, both uh, started from some whistleblowers and uh, started from the government uh, uh, passive uh, responses uh, then uh, realizing of uh, the fears of the issues try to mobilize their resources uh, to uh, uh, deal with cope with uh, uh, the disease uh, the pan pandem at that time, uh, epidemic uh, and uh, uh, eventually both uh, accomplished uh, what they, from Chinese perspective today, they accomplished what they wanted to accomplish. But the most important difference in uh, my mind here is that uh, uh, at this time, uh, China uh, has been much more uh, confident after came out of this uh, process, process. I mean, oh, maybe that's the wrong word. It's a more kind of uh, in the two sides. On the one side, because of this uh, 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 scale and the consequences of uh, uh, this uh, pandemic uh, uh, has gone uh, through all over the world. So many people died, so many countries suffered so much. They become so kind of uh, uh, concerned if the world would uh, uh, come to China to blame China, what kind of uh, consequences uh, uh, China would uh, bear on this. Uh, so they become very defensive uh, on and this issue, uh, uh, more defensive than the uh, last time. Second, uh, uh, because all the other countries uh, suffered in this process, uh, even today, uh, still uh, not uh, uh, came out of uh, these uh, uh, crises, uh, while China uh, within, uh, I mean, a month or so, uh, quickly using their resources and uh, their so-called uh, uh, authoritarian um, power uh, controlled uh, the the disease. So China becomes uh, more confident in this concept uh, context uh, to uh, deal with other countries. Uh, so uh, they become, to a certain extent, in my mind, more arrogant uh, in uh, in that uh, uh, at this stage and uh, try to blame uh, others, uh, try to show. Uh, how uh, their uh, actions, their political systems are working um, better. Although I agree with uh, Ambassador Boucher's uh, view that all the three aspects you talked about uh, are uh, uh, in trouble, China may uh, uh, not come out uh, well eventually. But from Chinese perspective, I will see somehow uh, these cities from very different perspectives. Uh, I. Uh, on those uh, WeChat uh, uh, groups, I even those very, very educated, Western educated scholars in Peking University and some other places, uh, they blamed uh, uh, other countries, not even Zhao Lijian, this kind of uh, wall, um, uh, uh, wolf uh, diplomat, they call Zhan Nang Wei Jiao Guan, the wall wolf type of a diplomat in the West, we see that person totally trash. But he was uh, so well respected. And uh, Xi, I heard, I tried to figure out what uh, go, what's going on there. Xi Jinping, in fact, told the, the foreign ministry, 
that the challenge to fight back whenever the Western countries try to uh, um, attack China's uh, interests. Today, just today in the Global Times, you, uh, you saw that article try to press China Zhan Nang Wei Jiao, the wall, uh, uh, wall uh, diplomacy, because they thought at this time, China facing a lot of challenges from world and also from Western countries. Why China, why the challenges? Because China is successful. That's the kind of logic they have. So in that context, they are not only more defensive, to a certain extent, they become more offensive uh, in the responses or in response to the result of the current development of this uh, uh, COVID-19. I think ultimately the, the key difference is going to be uh, in the economics. Uh, SARS had no substantial economic effect at all. Uh, in the crackdown on controlling the virus, uh, China is able to bring together the, the great strengths of, of its system. Uh, as they deal with the economic consequences, the, the leveraging of property, the, the widespread uh, high debt, the, the, the crushing of much of the entrepreneurship of, of the pri private sector system, the, the crushing of the autonomous entrepreneurial uh, energies of the local government, uh, which is a big source of China's economic success up to now. Uh, all those are going to, uh, th those are going to be the weaknesses of the system that, that come into play. So uh, uh, some of the, some of the arrogance uh, uh, may dissipate in the coming couple of years. On the economic front, let me add one point here. Uh, because uh, I agree with what uh, Dr. Ophoff that uh, the economic consequences might be very serious, more serious for China uh, at this time. But on the other hand, I talked to the, some friends in China. Uh, they are more confident than we thought they, they are. They thought uh, they are much better prepared uh, for this type of crisis. Uh, and uh, because of the trade war between China and US, uh, they were already tried to um, uh, develop their own uh, self-reliance self type of industrial uh, production chain to prevent, not the, uh, they, they did not talk about that time about pandemic, but uh, just the kind of decoupling between US and China, so they prepare for that. They uh, try to compete with the United States. In fact, you, I read the uh, Xinhua News uh, agency just uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about uh, how China's uh, uh, manufacture uh, 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 production chain has uh, uh, almost 19 or what kind of categories uh, they have uh, 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 in the UN uh, system. Uh, only China has established that kind of uh, uh, capacities. And now they try to upgrade. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping used a new term now called Xin Ji Jian, the new infrastructure construction. Instead of the, uh, the, the railroad, uh, uh, the, the, the transportation, all those kind of uh, old uh, uh, infrastructure, they have an eight new uh, sectors of uh, infrastructure trying to build. Uh, after, I mean, during this uh, pandemic. And uh, uh, they, for them, they said, yes, China will suffer for sure. But other countries will suffer more than China will suffer. And uh, looking at the, uh, the just came out, the uh, export uh, uh, numbers, uh, China is, not, is, is, is bad, but not as bad <laughs> as people expected at very first place. So in that context, I don't know how, of course, these are different from the SARS, for sure, they will suffer, the consequences, economic consequences will be more serious. But in a comparative perspective, how this um, economic consequence would be for China and also in comparison with other countries, I think that's still another issues we can discuss. 
if I can just add to what Sam says, just because some of us don't think China has done well coming out of this or will do well coming out of this does not mean that we can't do a lot worse. <laughs> and, <laughs> the to that. Richard. <laughs> and to some extent, stature in the world is going to be comparative, not, uh, not on some perfect scale. Yeah, we have lost all the jobs since the depression. <laughs> I, I, I agree with both those sets of comments. I, I, I just want to add a qualification. Uh, China is very confident that this uh, top-down uh, uh, focus on building particular sectors and particular companies uh, will be very successful. In, and uh, American politicians, including especially President Trump, are, are terrified of this. When I started my career, Japan was doing this. And it, it, it had some tremendous successes, uh, very expensive successes. And it had a lot more very expensive failures. The biggest, if you study the history, was that what the Japanese called the fifth generation computer artificial intelligence program. It was their biggest and, and most uh, expensive uh, industrial policy effort. And it was a complete disaster. And I, I would find it difficult to argue that the Chinese effort in this regard is as sophisticated as the Japanese effort was. So I, I, um, while I agree that, that with, with Ambassador Boucher that oh, we're capable of screwing up more than they do, uh, that a lot of this confidence in the top-down structure uh, it, may turn out to be misplaced. Yeah. Thank you all so much for your remarks. Uh, this, is, this definitely has uh, had a lot of impacts on uh, what, uh, what, what, a, what a lot of um, news on China that we've been seeing, whether it's a trade war, uh, the arguments that China might be uh, in disadvantage, at least in a, a comparative disadvantage with United States and trade war and how Dr. Zhao mentioned that there might be a reversal and how China might be expanding on the infrastructures uh, and how there, there might be new infrastructure compared to uh, how China was trying to expand infrastructure perhaps through the Belt and Road, through the, um, <coughs> through the Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank. And one follow-up question that we would like to kind of pose to you guys is, uh, as certain politicians in the West have been, become more skeptical of globalization, how much of a role do you see, uh, do you see interdependence in China's economy playing going forward? I think this is an area where China basically has it right. And, uh, uh, above all the Trump administration, but also the, the leaders of the, the Democrat Party uh, in the Congress uh, have a, 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 a deglobalization uh, instinct. And uh, uh, the right wing talks about decoupling as, as if this were a great advantage. Um, if the U.S. decouples itself from the China market, and General Motors survives because of the China market. Uh, the movie industry survives because of the China market. The entire luxury sector survives because of the China market. And the styles and clothes and music and shoes and things for all of my lifetime have been set by my generation, the baby boomer generation in the West. In the future, it's going to be set by 
who are now a relatively young Asian generation. And as the US thinks it can cut itself off from that and stay a, a leading economic power is absolute nonsense. And I don't see, I, I don't know what Biden is going to have to say about this, but I don't see any uh, major American uh, political leader understanding that well. Uh, they, they exaggerate the problems of globalization. Uh, they, they minimize the, the costs, the benefits of it. Uh, China is reaching out in new trade agreements. It's, it's trying to build the kind of system through BRI that we built through Bretton Woods. Uh, it was the secret of our, our global economic and political success. Uh, we won the Cold War because, because we had that kind of outreach and it, it made ourselves and our allies prosperous. Uh, and the Soviet Union didn't. Now we're not gonna become isolationist like the Soviet Union, obviously. But the, the, the analogy would be France after World War II. France was a great power. When I was growing up, if, if you wanted to be a, a serious international diplomat or businessman, you had to learn French. Uh, and France was just enough more protectionist than the rest of the developed countries that it just would and, and uh, so China's, China's outreach for all its difficulties has the basic strategic perspective, right? And, and the Trump administration and the leading congressional Democrats like Pelosi and Schumer have it absolutely wrong. I agree with uh, Dr. Overhoff, the uh, view here, the backlash against uh, globalization is largely come, uh, coming from uh, uh, the inequality, basically um, distribution of the benefits of uh, the globalization among different countries and among different uh, uh, social sectors uh, within uh, country. Uh, in fact, uh, China uh, has been the largest beneficiary of the globalization. And the uh, U.S. Uh, benefited also from this uh, globalization, especially this uh, what we call liberal uh, round of globalization since the uh, end of Cold War 1980s, uh, and uh, up to I mean Trump came to office, uh, the backlash. Uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, benefited, but not as much uh, as China. So that's why we see these uh, Western countries, uh, uh, China, uh, U.S., uh, U.K., some other. Western countries have uh, come uh, uh, jump into the backlash, and uh, China, uh, in that context, uh, really uh, wanted to maintain the momentum of the uh, globalization. But the problem for uh, the Western countries to work with the China's uh, so-called concept of globalization is that uh, uh, China's uh, 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 China has played the, the game. Uh, uh, not uh, uh, according to the rules uh, very often. So that's the problem. They benefited because they did not uh, su subject to the similar rules that uh, the Western countries subject. They always, always claim they are developing countries and uh, try to get all the perks of the development countries, but it's no longer a uh, development country. It's a uh, larger, I mean, China himself, Xi Jinping himself, already using the uh, big power diplomacy, Da Guo Wei Jiao, the big power China is already. So China now has to be subjected to the same rules of uh, other countries. So uh, in that context, uh, China's uh, position in the globalization has been changed. And uh, uh, China, uh, although they still talk about globalization, but they have to deal with the backlash of the uh, globalization. In fact, uh, one, of them's, uh, one of them is so-called decoupling, uh, what uh, the U.S. tried try to do. I, um, before the pandemic, I was uh, uh, somehow optimistic about uh, uh, the uh, difficulties of uh, 
uh, decoupling because of uh, the interdependence uh, between China and the US and also Chinese economy and global uh, e economy uh, and uh, the costs of the decoupling will be very, very high. But uh, uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, or a couple of months, I try to reevaluate the cost. And the cost now uh, uh, for the decoupling for US and other countries becomes much less uh, than used to be. Uh, because of, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, not only on the technology front, these kind of medical supplies is a very good example. Uh, most of those supplies are produced uh, in China in the so-called production chain, division of uh, labor. But China could uphold those products, especially during this crisis. The cost for the United States in this case is much higher uh, than uh, simply uh, 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 decou decouple. So Ch Ch the, the other countries would reconsider the cost of uh, 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 the decoupling or uh, deglobalization, unless China change its behavior, which I don't know how much China will change in this context. That's a that's a problem for the uh, move, moving forward of uh, globalization. I hope globalization will move forward, it benefits everyone. But even for this uh, uh, so-called collaboration on the uh, 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 pandemic, I'm so disappointed. This is the so-called uh, non-traditional security issue. It's a, not like a security dilemma in the military front. My uh, security is your insecurity. So I want to increase my security in all you are concerned, then you try to fight against me. This uh, pandemic, global crisis will hurt everyone. I mean, my security is your security. My insecurity is your security. Unless you are secured, I can not be secured. This kind of context, nobody try to work together. This is a very big disappointment to me. Why? Because of costs. Because of cost issue. I work with you, the cost is higher than I just fight against you. So that's the problem of globalization test context. That makes me so sick and disappointed. Let me make uh, one or two brief additional comments. Um, the decoupling is uh, a farce. Um, it's snake oil. Um, I, we, I was talking to a guy that works with one of the manufacturers of ventilators who said they, the ventilators are made with parts from 23 different countries. Um, the idea that even for something like that, you'd be able to source all the technology, all the production in the United States is almost ridiculous that even if you could do it and, and you probably can, um, you'd have to build this huge wall around the United States so that nobody who was making things outside the US could get them in. Um, and second of all, the cost of the product would go up enormously. Um, so you'd, you'd be sitting there inside your wall and the rest of the world would be going on at lower prices with more connections and more efficiency. Um, and that's true of almost every product. Um, so the idea that somehow we're going to divide this into U.S. world and China world, you know, if U.S. world is just the United States, uh, China world is going to be Africa, Latin America, Europe, China, Asia. Um, we're no longer part of the world. And, and deglobalization is costly, ineffective, not valuable. Now, that having been said, the virus is accelerating some of the changes that were already underway. Companies were moving supply chains out of China because the wages were going up. And so things that needed low cost labor to produce manufacturing for exports were starting to move towards Vietnam and Bangladesh and Ethiopia and places like that. Um, more and more were moving towards uh, more automated factories requiring high, higher, more qualified workforce. Some of that's coming back to the US, some of it's going back to Taiwan. And what you're ending up with is you make things in China for the China market. You make things in Europe for the European market. You make things in the US for the US market. And you use uh, you know, American designs and brands and we make a lot of money just by holding those designs and brands. But then you use more highly 
like highly skilled labor, but in less quantity and more automated equipment. Um, so those trends are accelerated by the virus. Uh, people don't want supply chains that are quite so long as they were before. They don't want to have single source of anything. So they want several places making the same thing. So if something happens here, they can move there. We thought that kind of movement was going to happen after floods in Thailand wiped out the hard disk drive production or after Fukushima in Japan. Uh, but I think, you know, it's been underway. It's just, it's accelerated again. So people are going to have different ways of making things, but much more automated much more localized for the market that they want to be in um, and much less uh, uh, much less low cost labor and that's in the long run that's probably a good trend for the United States. Awesome um, so I just had a quick follow-up question about that so we spoke a lot about globalization and you know interdependence between China and other countries and just China's economy more broadly but I think it would be really interesting if we had a little bit of dialogue about what things functionally look like on the ground in urban versus rural areas, because we talked a little bit of, about how, um, you know, about kind of what the effects of globalization are on China. But I was just wondering what, if you all had any insights into the inequality between rural and urban areas when we're kind of talking about whether or not China really has developed, become a developed country. Inequality is a serious problem in China. Uh, and inequality between urban and rural areas uh, is, is a, a big problem. But the, the way China has managed its development, everybody has moved up. So, you don't, you don't have any major social economic stratum that's lost. And, and, and they haven't just moved up, they've moved up a lot. Uh, and the labor intensive industry has meant that a, a very high proportion of the population has been drawn into the modern economy. Uh, and uh, complete contrast with Asia, for instance, where, where uh, there's this great disjunction. Uh, they haven't, and he hasn't been able to build the infrastructure, hasn't been able to deliver the education. Uh, so uh, is rural China part of the modern world? Ab absolutely not. Our, are they at a higher level than uh, other uh, competing countries whose systems we Americans like better? Yeah, uh, they're at a much higher level. Uh, a, a, a lot of the rural population is actually working in the city and benefiting. The, one of the most important reductions of inequality is, is the change of the role of women in China. Women leave the villages to assemble computers, uh, to make textile. Uh, uh, they become the ones who are exposed to the modern world. Uh, they be, become the ones who have a nest egg to make the down payment on a house. Uh, uh, this is transformative and it's, it's particularly, it, 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 it's socially transformative in villages to an extent that, that I don't think there's been much analysis of. Uh, my, although there's still a lot of gender inequality in China, uh, my favorite indicator of the change is that the woman used to have to bring a dowry. Uh, now, the man has to bring an apartment. She will not date you if you don't bring an apartment. That's a male dowry. So, uh, and, and the change is most transformative in the rural areas. Uh, you talk to these women, and there are a number of books about this. 
who are now in Guangdong having migrated out of Guizhou or someplace. Uh, and they say, the biggest benefit is I'm out from under the thumb of my, of my father and my brother. Uh, and I just feel empowered. So uh, China has been extraordinarily successful in developing both the urban and the rural areas. Uh, but as in a high proportion of developing countries, probably the only exceptions are South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore. Uh, Urban rural inequality is very profound. Uh, it's a different kind of life, uh, and it's going to remain for a long time. I think here issue, of course, uh, urban rural is a big issue here. Uh, it's a uh, inside of the urban areas, those uh, uh, young people, those uh, new graduates uh, to find jobs. I think that's a big uh, problem for the Chinese. Uh, leadership deal with in the next uh, several years, especially now the international market is somehow uh, collapsed for the Chinese exports uh, and uh, a lot of people uh, lost their jobs. Uh, so that's why Li Keqiang, the premier, has been so concerned about employment issues. I think uh, Chinese have not given us uh, accurate uh, numbers of uh, unemployment. unemployment. My sense is a very, very serious in China it will become uh, only more serious. Uh, that's a big uh, uh, social issue in terms of inequality. I um, uh, met a lot of young people. I invite some young Chinese serving scholars, uh, young uh, PhD students or MA students coming to uh, visit us, then went back. A lot of them cannot find jobs now. And the new, the, every year they have so many people graduate from colleges and these people uh, will be even more difficult for them to find jobs. Uh, and uh, along with the declining of the construction, those kind of traditional construction projects, those uh, uh, immigrants, immigrant workers uh, from rural areas to come to the uh, cities will be also difficult to find jobs. Uh, we already see some of these type of uh, 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 protests in the last several weeks. I saw some uh, on the WeChat. Uh, uh, so this will become even more serious. That will be concern for the leadership and also watched by outside. Great, thank you very much. So uh, now that we are almost, uh, almost running at time, we would just like to uh, ask each panelist to introduce any final remarks that they believe are kind of issues that they, believe, they feel that uh, they want to share before we conclude the panel. And can we start with Professor uh, Ambassador Boucher? The thing is that how this crisis eventually turns out will have a big effect on both US politics and Chinese politics. It's also going to have an effect on how we go on making things in the future. But I think in the end, uh, American companies are going to be involved in the China market. Chinese companies are going to be involved in the United States. Uh, we're going to find uh, areas of the world where we compete and where we cooperate. Um, and unless we can sort of get back to work on the rules that everybody ought to follow and making sure that everybody follows them, um, we're not going to have, you know, we're going to have these continued tensions. But in the end, most of this discussion on theory, on decoupling or whatever else uh, is out of touch with reality. Uh, and reality is gonna take its course, whatever people say. Thank you very much. Dr. Oberholt. I guess the thing I'd like to emphasize is, is what I think uh, has been forgotten on both sides. Uh, of the Pacific recently, the extraordinary mutual benefits of, of Chinese-American collaboration. We have lifted the whole world up economically. It's not just China that's benefited. The whole world has been lifted up 
economically uh, in the last 40 years by, by this dynamism that's been created. Uh, the national security benefits of that are enormous. Countries have been stabilized. The human benefits are almost beyond articulation. Number of people in other parts of Asia, in, in, in Africa, in, in Latin America, who who are not facing the kind of poverty and the that kinds of, of periodic great crises that they they used to face, um, and we need somehow we need to deal with with the issues between us. The issues are very real. If, if Chinese companies like Huawei have the ability to tap all the markets and take over the world market, and the European companies and American companies have no right proportionally to access the Chinese market, they'll die. All the, Europe, the Western companies die. Uh, and, and it's not it, 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 nothing to do with with uh, relative smarts or efficiency. Uh, so we we have to address those issues and deal with them. Uh, but the tendency on both sides uh, to demonize the other and 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 not to add up the the incredible benefits for ourselves and for the world of, of collaboration. Uh, we, the kind of people who are on this panel and, and in the audience, need to get very vocal with our leaders about uh, focusing on both sides of the balance sheet. And, and the positive side is very large. I think China is uh, uh, in a critical historical uh, juncture because uh, it faces uh, what a lot of people call the mid-income uh, trap. Uh, China's development uh, in the last 40 years uh, since reform started uh, has been very impressive. In fact, I came to uh, the US 35 years ago, China was a very backward uh, society. Now it's become a second largest economy. I went back to China and could not recognize uh, what China has been uh, 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 through. And uh, I'm very, very happy for China, what China has accomplished. Since Chinese people enjoy all those modern uh, life um, uh, development, it's a great thing to see. However, uh, uh, at this point, uh, could China uh, continue this kind of uh, uh, growth without making fundamental changes. Uh, that's a big issue for the Chinese leadership and also for the world uh, to look to look at. Uh, there are several issues uh, here. Uh, one is the economic development model. So far, they have uh, using state capitalism. Uh, uh, I mean, there are some variations different period. Uh, Keynes then Keynes December 1990s, 1980s. Uh, then the 21st century, uh, different uh, uh, here to have different emphasis, but the state uh, uh, centric uh, economic development model has been dominant and the uh, private economy has developed, but uh, uh, has not contributed to a lot uh, to the employment and also to the economic growth. But the Xi Jinping now has emphasized state owned enterprises uh, and uh, this type of economic uh, development uh, approach could that uh, uh, successful to uh, go through the so-called mid-income uh, trap uh, Xi Jinping announced in during Chinese New Year. I mean, Yuan Dan, uh, not Chinese, the New Year that Chinese uh, per capita income reached ten thousand uh, U.S. dollars, uh, which is a very uh, impressive, but uh, 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 to go. Beyond that, uh, uh, can use continue to use this uh, uh, type of uh, state centric, uh, state owned enterprises uh, uh, centric uh, approach to continue the economic development. In fact, Chinese economy is uh, it's uh, slowing down, 
uh, what are the causes for the uh, slowing down, how to overcome that, what kind of reforms economic front you can do to stop that, uh, uh, I mean not stop, to, to, to cope with that uh, <clears throat> development trend. Second here is uh, political uh, system. Could the one party uh, role, especially since Xi Jinping came uh, uh, to power, then uh, 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 centralization of power, uh, control of the society, uh, control the information, everything, uh, uh, continue uh, to help uh, the economic development. Uh, uh, would China have to uh, uh, lose those controls, uh, even open up some of those kind of political uh, control in order to maintain this uh, development. That's another issue I think we have to watch and China leaders have to look at. Third front I think is the uh, international front. China has been facing uh, more and more tough or tougher and tougher uh, international environment. And, uh, and many people are so, many countries are so alarmed uh, by what China has done, uh, uh, even during this pandemic uh, period. And uh, 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 to certain extent, I think China has been overreached, uh, overconfident uh, in its ability. Uh, 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 from Paul Kennedy wrote uh, at, during the end of Cold War about rise and fall of great power, talking about the fall of great powers uh, is because of old tension, overreach. Uh, uh, China has not become a, a great power yet. If it's already overreached, uh, then China would get into trouble. And uh, some Chinese scholars have warned that Xi Jinping at uh, People University, he, he used a Chinese term, right? I mean, when the overreach, I tried to find Chinese term, I did not find it well. He used Chinese term, I like it, uh, strategic overdrafting. You overdraft. Uh, your resources to reach those uh, goals you cannot reach and uh, created so many so many bad measures. So I think China now has is uh, 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 facing this kind of dangers of uh, uh, more and more overreach and uh, making more and more uh, difficult difficulties for itself. So if uh, those three aspects of issues are not uh, changed, I don't know if China can go through the uh, mid-income uh, trap to continue its growth. And uh, we will deal with the same type of China in 10 years from now. Um, I just wanted to, we were just about out of time, but on behalf of Brown China Summit, I wanted to thank all three of you so much for coming on here with us. I know that this didn't work out how we exactly wanted it um, because of COVID-19, but we are so appreciative that you came on here. This was a really constructive dialogue. I know it will be very educational and instructive for all of our audience. So just really wanted to thank you so much for your work in preparing for this and for coming on with us. We really appreciate it.